What follows here um, is, is a, a set of slides that uh, uh, we've put together uh, try explaining what it is that we do that's innovative, which allows us to actually federate queries in the medical informatics platform. I'm, not, I'm, going, I'm calling this federated queries, but I'm not going to talk so much about the federation as I'm going to talk about the actual technology challenges that we, that we, had to fa that we faced and we had to address. Because you see, this is the dream world of a computer scientist. You meet up with, with domain scientists like the rest of you, neuroscientists, doctors, what not, and you were hoping to bump into a problem that actually advances not only the me medicine, but also computer science. And this is the case here. So uh, let's start with, a, with a, a, a goal here. You've heard, I'm sure, since the morning uh, the, 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 that the issue here in medical informatics uh, the sub-project is actually to derive disease signatures, biological disease signatures. So here's one example, probably you've seen many, but here's one example, right? You have a comma-separated value file that's just an ASCII file with values that are separated by the delimiter, in this case the comma, and this file um, uh, contains clinical information about patients, such as their age, or results of their blood tests, like protein levels, their symptoms, etc., etc. And then you have a binary array format that maps the patient's brain in a coordinate space and keeps the measurements of the gray matter volume for each coordinate. And that's on the right hand side, which essentially translates that's a byproduct of that imaging file, that binary file, has this byproduct, this JSON file. Um, uh, which associates the great, great matter volume measurements with areas of the brain, such as the hippocampus. Okay, so uh, here CSV, binary, and JSON are three different data representation formats. So data is coded in the computer in three different ways, right? And um, a, a signature, for example, the final output of this data would be a signature that says that patients that are above the age of 50 whose amygdala's gray matter uh, volume is above 0 0.3 um, will and have some protein level lower than 1, uh, they suffer from Alzheimer's with high probability. That's, that's one idea, right? That's one, one kind of signature there. The issue here, what is what do you do with this data? How do you derive useful information such as this or results or question, query that data? How do you do this, right? Because you have data that's raw in very different, uh, in many different uh, um, formats and the biggest challenge here is the physical integration but you don't know what's going to be asked if you knew what's going to be asked then you could reverse engineer and just store the data in the best way possible for the future queries to be asked but each scientist each one of you will ask different queries on that data so this is the big challenge um, in this stack here that essentially shows the, 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 the medical informatics uh, you know, process, right? We start with federating all of the data under one umbrella, we integrate <coughs> the data together to one, to, so that they look like it's one database, not many different ones, then we can mine the data, do causal modeling, and eventually arrive at useful information, which is the biological signatures of diseases. The biggest challenge that we want to address here is that the data formats are, um, are diverse, as I said, but also we can't move the data because here we're talking mostly about data that's heavily tinted. So that data means that we can't move it, we can't copy it, we can't transform it or alter it in any way. Um, why is that a problem? Well, the computer scientists of you know that the number one thing that database products do when they have to handle data is load the data, structure data, put it in a different place in a way that the database program can actually access them more efficiently. And that's copying, and that's what we're not allowed to do here. So by, from moment one, most of the products out there are out of the question. And we can have a thread of technical discussion later in the break on that aspect if you want. By the way, feel free to interrupt. I can very well omit some slides with technical details at the end. If you don't understand something, because it's very important to understand this stuff. So what do we want to do? First of all, in the medical informatics lab, we would have those hospitals that participate, which have sorts of all sorts of data, right, from scans, from clinical labs, all sorts of stuff. And then we have the users. Most of these users are going to be people from those hospitals, but I just have them in green here because they, are, they play a different role in this hierarchy. 
And they visualize, they will analyze, or they, they want some help for diagnosis using that data. The medically performed maps platform is this blue structure in the middle, where through a unified portal, that's you know fancy word for web page, right? Through a web page, they access this magic called the federation that makes many databases look like one. Okay? And then each database here has the ability to access and query and send that results to the data that is made available to the HPP. Now, the data obviously is not the original data that the patients have delivered. It's a copy of the data that's anonymized and made public, but still that copy is very heavily tinted. So that copy has to be anonymized multiple times and we have very heavy structures in order to make sure that's done in, in the right ways. So each hospital creates a local store, a database essentially, which is given, is put to the disposal of the HPP. At the shoe right here, the local store looks like this, that you know, hospital gray stuff is on the left hand side, and this blue box here is a disk, okay, with a computer attached to it. So the disk has data of various forms, it's, it extracts data um, uh, in CSV and uh, image format, DICOM format, then there is anonymization processes happen, right? Um, then um, the data is converted in, in different formats, it will be aggregated to, and other kinds, several kinds of raw data in various formats are produced at every step of this process. Queries that come from the rest of the network eventually come right here at the door. This is where the door is, right? And at the door, there is a database that can accept questions and can give back results. Okay, it's a program that can access data and give back results, right? And then, of course, that small box here is really a big box where every, the rest of the world is, the other hospitals, the other users, and they can communicate with the data of our hospital right here. You don't only ask queries, obviously, you ask mining questions like the ones that the previous speakers have mentioned, which are more complicated, they involve correlations, they involve execution of exter ex external statistical <coughs> packages and things like that. So the objective here is that users view all the data as one database and they can ask any query they want to that data. I think it's very impressive. I mean, do you already have the... Are you already attempting to extract information from clinical reports and the like? I mean, I, I guess it's far more challenging than extracting... Yes, and I will allude to have an example oh, actually right. for documents, not in detail though, but the answer is yes, eventually that's the... The idea, right? Every just like clinical reports, that is probably one of the more challenging mm -hmm. examples because it's not just unstructured. There is issues with correctness, with coherency, with all that stuff. All sorts of document processing challenges exist here. Uh, but there's also, a, and it's in the big umbrella of the physical integration of the data that I was talking about. First of all, how do you extract the interesting information, and also how do you combine it with other stuff? So there's two ways to do it. One is to copy everything together. Pre-prepare pre everything together under a, norm, a, a, a structure. Had the data not been tinted, that might have been a viable way to do it. Uh, but in this case, it's not possible. So this is under this umbrella of integration challenges. So I, I don't quite understand if. So thinking about image data for a minute, so that that's going to undergo some post-processing at this stage within, within the blue box. And uh, so is all that pre-processing, it's pre-defined processing. So you, yes. there's no capability for users to, you know, if they've got their, their own new registration algorithm or whatever it is, can they upload it to a central computer somewhere that will run that on the raw data, or is that not going to be an option? Um, everything is an option. The question is, this specific data set that you're talking about, yeah. yes, it's public, but there's several versions of public, right? So means, this means you can actually, there's several grades, I should say. So if this is a data set that can be copied anywhere, and then it's, it's marked as such. So the user that wants to, to, to copy, it's like the admin data, right? I can access the admin data, I can move the admin data anywhere, that's fine, mm. right? Uh, but if this is a data set that corresponds to a set of patients, 
And this is data that's been anonymized, but it's actually only to stay at the hospital. Then only a subset of queries are allowed on that data, and certainly you can't copy the, the, the whole data set everywhere, somewhere else. No, but that's, that's what Chris is asking. So, it's, 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 so the, the, the trivial answer to your question, which should put Anastasia in the way you're coming from, is, is that each of these is customizable. Each of these is what we talked about before is a different app. Right. So you could imagine an app for normalization for the purposes of HPP for creating the disease signatures. You would, when, you, when you got your query together, you, you would press a button and put up in, in all, the, all the HPP apps so that everyone was putting in data of the same sort at the same time mm -hmm. when it was coming from the multiple databases. But there's nothing to stop you having an app for your hospital, for your, for example, management, Right. to say how many, and, and there you want to define uh, dimension in some different way, yeah. so you, you create it in that different way and you, you just plug it in in your workflow here and all that stays within your hospital. Or you might have a country would like to do it with a specific diagnostic setup which it uses for pricing its stuff, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, DRG or whatever, you could have a DRG set of apps which would put all the data in. But the data is always raw. That's the critical thing. So I and have it, to it, say, it, let me let me just uh, right? if I finish this, so we can move on. I have to say that technically speaking, um, the challenge that I'm talking about, the technical challenge, has is, is orthogonal to what it's allowed, to, what the data is allowed to 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 do, be copied, be moved, be anything. So uh, that doesn't. That, the, the issue is that we don't have the mechanisms. To query raw data if the raw data is not allowed to go anywhere else. In a, in a, to query it sufficiently broadly and sufficiently efficiently, right? In, in, in sufficiently small response times. That is a problem. This is a technical challenge. And again, everything that comes to the data will pass multiple filters to make sure that whatever is attempted to be done on the data is allowed, right? Legally, anonymization wise, and all that good stuff. So yeah, it's 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 very easy to confuse the terms. So, so there, yes, yeah. Uh, the processing phase. Do you expect it to take like a year, two years? How often are going to be data? This is real time. So basically, the the data comes um, from the, the private patient database. The hospital makes available this storage structure here, which contains all of the data that is to be visible, accessible by the rest of the HPP participants and by the general public when that happens, right? Uh, this, process, this data is immediately available through an anonymization filter. Now, as you said, the processing. Here, there isn't processing that has to be done before. You can just access the raw data. And that's the point, exactly. If you have a traditional database system, you would have to load all of this data in a traditional database system, but you don't have to do it anymore. So, let me, I'm going to tell, tell you a little bit more about the technical side and maybe that's going to be clarified. So, the bottom line is that we found this application to restrict us in what is the software that we can ever use, right? And we ended up trying to, uh, wanting to really access raw data in situ without really having the, the, um, the uh, jurisdiction over, over what happens to the data from the program, from the database system. And that was a revolution in our minds. Because when you load, or you, you, you buy Oracle, you load the data into Oracle and then you can use the data. Not, not anymore, not possible here. So we built first, these structures, these mechanisms, we did a lot of research and we built these mechanisms which allow us to actually access and query raw data through positional mechanisms that tell us where the data is, the interesting data is, and then keep interesting data locations in mind for future queries, taking an advantage of the user's interest not moving very often. Right? So if you have a sea of data, you will swim a little bit in one lake, and then you will swim in some other lake, and you will swim in some other lake, but it's going to be a while before you move around. And that's called locality in, 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 uh, in computer science. So we, we take advantage of this, and we make sure, well, what we, and we make sure to 
keep in mind what is the really interesting data that the users have found during the process of querying an answer. What is the locations of that data? Which are the locations of that data? And so we can go to those much faster. So adaptively, the response times become faster. Okay? And that's a very basic me mechanism that we, we put together. But then we realized that what we were doing, essentially, was that we were harmonizing data to some level that was virtualized. So we abstract data from the original formats to this level that it's the user that tells us which are the data we should be building the database with. It's not the data that tells us that. It's with usage, the user essentially, without them even knowing, builds a database in the back of their head. But there is no database in the beginning. So we went from the DB world to a non-DB world, where there's no database. It's just a query engine that allows you to access and query raw data, initially slowly, but then adaptively faster. So the next version of this system that we built together was that, um, was that we, we moved from this world where you have, for example, different kinds of data. These are databases that you've loaded the data in, and this is Oracle or DB2 or SQL Server. And then you have external data sources, all sorts of data where you can possibly go with other data processing engines like search engines, Google, Yahoo, whatever, right? To a world where we have a layer that harmonizes all possible data formats and gives a, a very a, a virtualized face of the data to any program that would want to access the data. So you need essentially two things. One is right here, the inner oval, where you can access any kind of data, any kind of raw data. And the other is the outside oval, which actually can talk to any kind of software as if the data had been loaded for that software. Okay? So that is the revolution. That is the technological revolution that we are up against here. And there can be no static decisions there. There can't be any static decision that loads the data. There can be any static decision that queries the data. Okay? Um, just because this is a technical talk, uh, Manus, uh, who's the lead student over there to, of, this, uh, of this project, put the, this query engine uh, structure where you have a query language that we build on top that can, act, can take a, queries in any language that's very useful. Uh, very, very common out there, SQL, XQuery, or anything you want. Um, this is a query language that's actually extended SQL with hierarchical features. Then you have a query executor, which is just in time. That means that the query operators, all this basic stuff, and I'll give you an example in a minute, are code generated. They don't exist from before, because any static decisions hurt the, 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 the system. And then you have descriptors of any possible data formats that essentially are adapters to that format. And you build those specifically to the format. And then you have a clear optimizer on the side which allows you to use the system resources efficiently for any query that comes in given what data it needs to access. So, bottom line, I'm going to talk to you about two things. One is, what is the basic mechanism that gives us the universality across query languages and data formats? And the other thing, I'm going to show you how you can build this just-in-time system that doesn't really exist, but it creates itself while the user asks queries. Okay? The first thing that we do is that we decide to, to have an internal representation for a query that comes in and allows us to essentially represent it and harmonize it with any other queries that come into any other kinds of data that come in. Now, uh, the most common query language in, in, uh, data, for databases across the globe is SQL. Who's heard of SQL before? Hopefully many more people than just the computer science students. So that's good. Um, SQL is simple, right? It's, it's straightforward to learn, and it's very declarative. That's its power. Right? You tell the system what you want. You don't tell the system how to do it. You just say, here's what I want. Here, I want the age of the patients. And here's the files that you're going to use. That CSV file, the patients, and that uh, JSON file, the brain regions. And you got to unify those files so the patient that you're looking at is, that, that's the brain region of that patient you're, that you're looking at. So this has to be the same. 
you can compare the patient uh, on one side, record on one side, the brain region of another patient, right? And we want where the, the gray matter volume to be more than 0 0.2. Okay, so that's a, that's a query. What we are going to translate to is something that looks more like a programming language, but its power is in this iterativeness, where essentially programming variables are assigned to files, and then you see all these predicates, but the most important thing is that you can do anything with that. You can do anything. So if, if there's another language, not SQL, XQuery or something, that has a record construction of any, any nested comprehensors or anything like that, it can also be translated to this monoid calculus, internal calculus. So we have this internal representation that allows to translate any kind of queries. And the other thing is that, uh, well, and then, and then this can be translated to an algebra, which can be fed into an optimizer for best use of system resources. And also, we can do any kind of data model, because wherever you see list here, so give me the output of all of the ages, of those patients where the amygdala, the gray matter volume is more than, than 0.2, you can have any other kinds of, of, of data models. So it's okay if that went over the head of some people here. Let me win you back. Here's the same query. Hopefully all of us understand a little bit what this query does, right? We find which are the patients, which are the ages of patients with this higher, with, with gray matter um, over 0.2. Now, a classical database system would look at these two files here that we saw in the beginning, would copy them, load them into another copy, and then would create, would, would use, would use pre-cooked algorithms to work on the copied data. And that's a classical database system. Okay? What we do is that we do the just-in-time database, which means that we have the source files. But, and when the query arrives, we code generate the algorithms that need, are needed in order to answer that query. And then we code generate the access paths to the files, and then we run the query. And then we build caches, positional and data caches, that allow us to go back to the interesting data, as I said, in subsequent queries. So this idea of dynamic code generation allows us to not have a pre-cooked system that we use in the beginning that, that makes any static decisions at all. We adapt to both the data formats, JSON or CSV in this case, but also to what the query does, because we're going to build those internal algorithms by having looked at the query and having looked at the data that's going to be used in the query, which is something that you couldn't have known in advance. You only know when the query arrives. Okay, so this is a fully code-generated system. Now, if um, I'm I talked about optimization, which is essentially a, the brain, if you will, of the system, right? The optimizer tells us, uh, here's the system resources here, how much memory you have, uh, here's what algorithms you already have from previous executions, here's what positions you already have. How do you put this together to make the next execution more efficient? And that's what the optimizer does. Optimizing a traditional system is very different than optimizing this system. So that's another research area for us that we're working on. And then finally, just to give you an idea of what queries similar to the one that I showed you behave like in a real setting with data from patients, a genetics data set, and brain regions combined all together using a template similar to this one, right? We ran uh, a few kinds of systems. One is, uh, well, we had actually, and that comes back to your question, I think, where you have numbers and JSON files and all that stuff, but you also have documents. So the first set of, of experiments was a column store and row store, which are the two different kinds of databases that you'll find out there today. And then each one also um, uh, combined with a separate document store. So whenever you wanted to combine documents and other kinds of data, you would have to actually pay some time fee, right? They were not all together. And that was actually pretty high in terms of, uh, of, of, of time. Uh, you get loading because the database has to load the data, and then the document store took a long time to load. And then this is the query running time right here. Now, if you didn't want to use the document store because that separates the data, you can flatten the documents before into tabular data, but that, as we know, is obviously not 
straightforward, right? You get a lot of decisions made from before, so that's not... Anyway, if you do that, you win in performance, you get some um, flattening time in the beginning, and then you have the loading for the database system for the rest of the data, and queries run faster because you flatten the document data that takes a lot of time. But then if you use raw, you only have querying, and because you really never use all of the data that you have, you only use a small part of the data, you only pay the price that you need to pay to just query the data that, you, uh, that you're going to access. So it looks like it's not going to be slower or much slower than using any alternative, which is exactly our goal here, to provide the functionality without paying too much performance. The user's perspective for the medical informatics platform is to have a unified portal, access to a unified portal where they can use uh, you know, uh, nice and, and, and uh, um, comprehensive tool sets for accessing the data. So they're not very going to see SQL if they don't want to, obviously, right? Because that's the point, that the user uses whatever they want. They see a schema of the data which is fully customizable. So this is the beginning schema, for example, for the shoot data. But if they don't want to see this anymore, or if they don't want to see this anymore, they can just forget about it and have a totally customized version of the schema or unify two different tables. Because that's all, that's all virtualized, so there's 100% freedom at that level. And when they send the query out to the federation, the query goes to the hospitals, to the participating hospitals, to those that have data that interest the query, and the answer comes back again through the unified portal. Okay? Last but certainly not least is that the people who want to use, to want to have much more direct access to the data than just a unified portal, can use notebooks. And the notebooks are the tool of choice of data analysts today. Okay, they exist in many flavors. IPython notebooks are most um, based on Python scripts are among the, the 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 most common. But there is also R Studio, Tableau, associated notebooks, and all other statistical package notebooks. <coughs> They are very nice environments in which you run a question and you get back the answer either you know, schematically or in graphs or in any way you want. You can save everything that you've done. That's why it's called a notebook because it's like running, writing on a piece of paper. It's saved automatically. You can then question to see, okay, in which of the experimental notebooks that I have did I use this file because I want to change it and rerun them and things like that. Um, we do have a version of IPython notebooks that we have developed between uh, the lab and now we, we start up. And Cesar, who is in the back there, is going to teach uh, some of you tomorrow. There's, I guess, a subgroup of you who will learn how to use notebooks to actually access and query the data and see the results. And it's really, really impressive. Okay. So just to, to give you, again, to go back to the, to the perspective, the impact of the medical informatic platforms um, uh, is it's, it, we aim for it to be a clinical data federation. And what we're doing is providing great technologies that respect anonymity. Okay? And the technologies is what I kind of tried to give you a gist about today. And what we're trying to support is complex data flow processing, which is what Jan is, is, is going to talk about next. So it's uh, the, how the data flows around the engine. Uh, Rule-based clustering, all the mining stuff that people do, and uh, uh, eventually support the creation generation of meaningful biological disease signatures. Okay, that's all I had to say.